Continuing our series on the book of Romans, and today we're dealing with the second half of Romans 13, and what we want to talk about today is how shall we now live in light of the gospel? How shall we now live? So the objective today is to understand and exhort the church so the church would walk in the ethical standards of love. So people think love is a feeling, and it's just an emotive response to how you feel or think about somebody or something. But it's a lot more than that. There are ethical standards that define love. So as I'm sharing, ask yourself these questions. Is love mer merely a feeling or desire? What does God's law have to do with love? Is there a need for inner transformation in order to walk in love? What does it mean to awake from sleep? And how do we make provisions for the flesh? Or provision for the flesh? And so the text today is Romans 13. As I said, we're going to go with verse 8 to 14. And Paul says, owe no one anything. Now he is saying this in the context of talking about giving taxes, verse 7. Uh, give taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. So he says, owe no man anything except to love one another. So now the whole framework here is shifting from how to relate to magistrates or political leaders and community leaders and people that have a position in the civic sphere over us to now how do we love and respect people in the population, the populace. So owe no one anything not just civic leaders and not just the state, except to love one another, for the one who loves has fulfilled the law. Now he describes the second part of the Ten Commandments. Very interesting. The first part is our obligation to God, which is, um, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven and earth, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, honor the Sabbath day. So those four commandments are our obligation to God. But the last six is what Paul quotes. It's interesting, he omits the first four because he understands the fact that they have two obligatory sections. One is our obligation to God, the second to men. So the context here is our obligation to humankind. So that's why he's not quoting the first four. And so he quotes some of them, not all of them, he says, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. So the focus is not vertical towards God, but horizontal towards humanity. Love does, does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Besides, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. The salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness, so that's our response, and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So Lord, give us that understanding. Give us that understanding. And so, he opens up by saying, oh no man, anything he brings everything out of the context of civil government now into our obligation to one another. And then he quotes some of the commandments he left out um, 
you shall honor your father and mother so to go well with you, which is the fifth commandment, basically. But he also says all the commandments are summed up in this, meaning including that commandment in that section. All of them fit under this, this theme. So it's interesting that we see here that love is not defined as a feeling. So if we are going to live a life as Christians and be disciples of Christ, we have to go way beyond the superficial view of love that is, uh, you know, framed in the world. And so the world, uh, they, they get married, they divorce, they get married, they divorce, I fell in love with this one, I fell in love with that one, or, you know, it, and it's because their north star that guides them is a feeling. But Paul has a different take on love. It's a way of life. It's a way of having an attitude. Uh, uh, it's motivations. It's based on walking according to the pattern of the moral law of God found in the second part of the Ten Commandments. You can see that in the book of Exodus chapter 20. So as Christians, we need to go beyond defining love as a feeling. We need to go beyond defining love as an emotion. If there's real love, there's going to be a corresponding way of life, corresponding attitude, co corresponding motivation. Uh, and so we see here that Paul quotes part of the Ten Commandments, which means that Paul assumes the continuity and legitimacy of the Ten Commandments, even in the New Covenant. There are people that teach and preach that the Ten Commandments are not relevant in the New Testament, that uh, he has done away with the law. But if that's true, then why did Paul use the Ten Commandments here as a rubric that defines love? So in Exodus 20, God was defining what true love is. Leviticus, somewhere else, he said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so the law was a way of walking out love in the context of a community. In that aspect, it was the nation of Israel, but Paul is bringing it over to Romans, meaning it is now a way to disciple nations. It's a way now to apply God's ethical standards in how to build a nation, how to disciple a whole nation, as Jesus tells us to do in Matthew 28, 19. So he brings the law uh, out of Israel into the nations because he's writing this book to the book of Romans to the church that is in Rome he's assuming the continuity and legitimacy of the Ten Commandments that's so powerful he even quotes the fifth commandment in Ephesians 6 when he quotes uh, it exactly and he says honor your father and mother so those who preach a hyper-grace message that annuls the law of God are biblically ignorant or intentionally ignoring passages like this. So you have hyper-grace preaching. It's just grace, 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 grace. No law, no law, no law. And they willfully neglect these patterns of New Testament scripture. And so... What we say we love somebody, uh, Paul also gives a definition of love by actions and attitude in 1 Corinthians 13. So as Christians, we have to go way beyond the world. Love is not just a feeling. Now, it's okay to have romantic feelings, erotic feelings, and this and that and the other thing, if you're committed to somebody, of course. But it has to transcend that. It cannot be just a physical thing. It cannot just be an emotional thing. There has to be a corresponding way of treating people. And if you say you love somebody, but you don't treat them in kindness, if, if you are constantly abusive, uh, which 1 Corinthians 13 would say is not love, um, then you are not you're not really walking in love. You don't love somebody if you're verbally abusing them all the time, calling them names. If you're always uh, uh, you know trying to make them feel horrible about themselves, that's not love. First Corinthians 13 goes along with this, and if you really want to know what true love is, look at First Corinthians 13 in the context 
of uh, the New Testament. And then you look at this. Now these are ways we deal with society at large as well as internally within our own ranks in the church. Furthermore, Jesus in what's called the Sermon on the Mount, if you look at Matthew chapters 5 to 7, he as the new Moses, it's not an accident that he did it on a mountain. Moses received the law on a mountain. Jesus gave a interpretation, an extrapolation of the law on a mountain because he was saying, I'm the new Moses. And I'm not going to go into Matthew's chapter 5 to 7, but if you just pour over that, you see that he's saying that the original intent of the Ten Commandments was internal, not just external. He said, it is written, shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that if you even lust after a woman, you've committed adultery already in your heart. That's Matthew 5, 27 and 29. So he wasn't abolishing the law. He was now giving the full interpretation of the law as the new Moses, as the true prophet, as the one they were looking for. Moses was a type and a shadow, as it says in Hebrews 3, of the one who was to come. Um, and so in this new exposition, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Again, reiterating the fact that there's continuity between the Testaments. It's one Bible. Yeah. I'm not a dual Testament guy. I'm not a divided Testament person. I don't treat the New Testament differently from the Old. It's one story Amen. with different application based on the finished work of Christ. Amen. Different understanding. The fullness of grace did not negate the Old Testament fullness of grace actually was amplifying what the grace of the Old Testament was originally talking about. So in this new exposition, Jesus made it clear that to follow the law, there had to be inward obedience, not mere behavior modification. And that's where legalism comes in. You have churches say, don't do this, don't do this, blah, 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 and they judge your Christianity by how you dress and how you act outwardly. Jesus said there's got to be an inward transformation. Amen. Even if you didn't have the Sermon on the Mount, Amen. if you look at the Ten Commandments, you have to have an inside transformation, an inward transformation to obey them. Because look at the commandment, you shall not covet. Covet is not an action. So the last commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods, that's an internal attitudinal thing. So that shows that if, you, if you're going to not covet, that means you have to have contentment in God, Good. emotional maturity. And so God demands emotional maturity in order for us to love one another. You can't love somebody if you're emotionally a child. You might be 44 years old, but you may be a 13-year-old the way you behave in your house when you're acting a certain way with your husband or with your children, acting like an infant. Because the moment you get traumatized in your life and you have unforgiveness, at that point of having unforgiveness, you stop growing emotionally in that area of your life. So you might be 50 years old, but in, in terms of emotional maturity, you're 15, not 50. Or 8. You know, so at a certain point in your life, you stop growing emotionally. So the commandments demand... That as a disciple of Christ, we grow. Amen. Um, and that's why, you know, you could have a lot of people that can preach great, they can prophesy, heal the sick, but they act like children. They're defensive when you talk to them. There's certain areas of their life they don't want you to touch. They don't want God to touch. Don't go there. Um, and any area of your life that you refuse to allow God to deal with, in that area, you are stunting your growth. And it's hurting your relationship with other people. It will definitely cap your life. Hurt your relationship with your family, your children, everybody. So, uh, and then Paul quotes part of the sermon that Jesus gave in Matthew 22. Uh, when he says, love is the fulfillment of the Lord. 
you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he's basically quoting, which means that the Gospels were already circulating during that time. He was quoting Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40, when Jesus said to love your neighbor as you love yourself uh, on these two commandments depend the law and the prophets, the first commandment being love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So as we move away from this section, now we go to another section where in response to this exhortation to respect, honor, and love everybody, using a true standard, meaning the law of God, so that love is not some mushy, mushy, gibberish, uh, subjective thing where it's all, you know, it's how you feel. No, love is a standard. I can tell you if you love me by the way you treat me. I can tell if you walk in love in your house by the way you treat your family. There's a true standard of love here. A rubric. A plumb line. First Corinthians 13, a poem that basically you could sing out that uh, is another standard that shows how much love we have. So in response to that, Paul then says, besides this, so he's using that word besides this as a way of segueing into another part of this epistle where we have to live a certain way, which is the theme of this message, how shall we now live in light of the gospel? Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. I love that. To be woke. Very popular term today. Nowadays, many progressives are into what's called intersectionality. And they utilize the term being woke regarding the connection between their various causes related to feminism, xenophobia, homophobia, sexism, social justice, racism, and the like. So intersectionality basically means that if you are a true feminist, you also have to have, believe in gay rights, you have to believe in a borderless uh, nation, you have to, in other words, intersectionality connects all the various causes based on being a victim together. And if you're not for all, then you're an enemy. You have to be for every one of their views. And they say that when you come into this intersectionality, you are woke. The term being woke is a biblical term that was co-opted by the far, far left progressive liberals to depict the people who finally understand their worldview and their assertion to the root issues of societal maladies. So basically, there are people who are woke and there are people who are not woke. They probably say that you're all the walking dead or you're all asleep, I don't know. But if you don't understand, receive, and advocate every issue they believe in, not one out of seven, you are not woke. But it's only the woke that understand the real issues. But as we can see, being woke or awakened from sleep has to do with a person finally being made aware of the insidious dark forces embedded in secular culture that lulls people to sleep with, e with external pleasures and distractions that almost brainwashes people and takes them away from understanding eternity and the things of value that come from God. People who are not woke in biblical terms are unaware of their true lost condition and their imminent danger the imminent danger of their soul. Uh, yesterday, I woke up to the news that Jeffrey Epstein yeah. killed himself. Yeah. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist person, <laughs> and I don't want to get into that, but I will say he probably was afraid of facing the music yeah. if he did kill himself. Some say he was murdered. Yeah. But he was probably afraid especially with all the uh, dossiers and, and paraphernalia they found detailing his sexual abuse of minors and implicating his friends and powerful people and his girlfriend and all that. He probably didn't want to face these people. 
So, in order to avoid the court of man, he hastened his facing the court of God because he was so dulled in his sense, in his senses, and his conscience darkened, so deceived that he probably didn't believe there was a God. And so the thing he feared is going to be compounded by an eternal God yeah. who will mete out true justice forever. Amen. And so unless he came to Christ, he fled one thing and ran into something far more dangerous for his soul divine justice. And Paul says, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is gone. The day is at hand. What does it mean salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed? Well, put yourself project into the past 2,000 years. Basically what he's saying is two things. One is now we understand Salvation, it's nearer to us, it's close to us. In the past, it was a mystery, especially to us Gentiles. It was something that was murky, something that wasn't for us. We weren't part of the covenant. But now, it's right here. But he's also talking about the fact that the older we get, the closer our full redemption is at hand. You know, I'm closer today than I was when I first believed to when I'm going to meet the Lord face to face. My salvation, meaning in this context, not initial salvation, forgiveness of sins, but a fullness of what I've been believing for all these years, meeting the Lord, is closer to me now, my full salvation is closer to me now, and if I live another 10 years, it'll be closer to me then. He said, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. The night is far gone refers to the former ignorance that the Gentiles had, that the world had. The night is far gone. We can see in the scriptures, like in Ephesians 4, verse 17, Paul says, I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, being ignorant of the life of, they, they're ignorant of the life of God. So, and that's due to the hardness of their heart. And so when he says that darkness, when the night is far gone, he's talking about the fact that now there is no excuse for any person. In the past, God winked at their ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. The night is far gone, but now the fullness of the gospel, the gospel, salvation, the good news is near to all. Amen. He's talking 2,000 years ago to a community of people that were used to only understanding gods with an S and not the one true God. Because only Israel was in covenant. But now salvation is near. He says the day is at hand. What does the day at hand mean? Again, it refers to the fact that the gospel has now been made manifest. The fullness of what he said in Acts 17. He says the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So there is no excuse for anybody. The darkness is far gone. The day is at hand. It's right in front. It's shining on every person in the globe, no matter where they live. The day is at hand. There's no more excuse for ignorance. Everybody is responsible to believe the gospel, and we are responsible to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. 2 Timothy 1, Paul says, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which has now 
been made manifest. The day is come through the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. The day has come through the gospel. Ephesians 3. Paul says in verse 4, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which has not been made known to the sons of men and other generations, as it has now been, now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. They are no longer in the dark. The day is dawned for the Gentiles. They're no longer outside of the covenant. To me, he goes on to say, in verse 8, Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach the, to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light the day has come. The dawning is here. The salvation is here. To bring to light to everyone. What is the plan of the mystery that was hidden for ages? Because they were in the dark. Who, from God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God, the mystery of God, might be now made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. We are called to make the gospel known. Wow. To bring the day wow. to earthly rulers and authorities as well as revealing the mystery and wisdom of God to the principalities of the air that rule nations. The wisdom of God is that now what Rome failed to do in trying to unite their empire through Caesar worship, only the true Caesar, Jesus, was able to do by uniting every nation, tribe, kindred, tongue, Amen. which once was only Israel, now the whole world is united. The fact that when we're here and we have different ethnicities, different skin tone, different economic background, different religious background, and we're here worshiping God together is a sign of God's wisdom to the powers, Amen. both invisible and visible. Amen. That Jesus is the only true Lord. He's the only one who could have united all of us. So what is our response? Paul says, so then let us cast off. I love that word, cast off. It's violent. In the original Greek, it's, you know, you just get that thing off me. Right. You cast it off. Cast off the works of darkness. You don't flirt with sin. You don't tiptoe around sin. You don't start flirting to, to women, nice looking women, and, and uh, you know, to waitresses or whatever. Stewardesses. You don't flirt. You don't mess around. You don't stick around. When people are involved in works of darkness. He said we're told to cast off the works of darkness. That has to do with you used to live a certain way as a Gentile, as a non-Jew. Now, not only are you not to do it, you're to cast it off. <coughs> Forcefully. Throw it off. And so, there has to be an internal, forceful disdain and volition against sin. If you don't hate sin, you will love it. There's no middle ground. We need to hate the things God hates and love the things God loves. It's not enough just to love what God loves. You need to also hate what God hates. And if you're not married and you're sleeping together and you're having sex together, then you don't love what God loves and you don't hate what God hates. You are flirting with sin. Instead of casting off darkness, you're in bed with darkness. Either you break up and get or, or get married. But don't play around with sin if you think you're a Christian. James said, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred with God? You're a Christian, and you're playing around with the world. James said, you hate God. Or at least the actions are hatred against God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world 
makes himself an enemy of God. He's saying that to Christians. Throw off, cast off the works of darkness. Do not play around with sin. Doesn't mean you can't hang out with sinners. What it means is that you cannot play around with their lifestyle. Big difference. And then he says, put on the armor of light. Wow. Let me just tell you, if you're not rough with yourself and not rough with sin and forceful, it's too powerful for you. You will fall into it. You don't have to worry about me. You have to worry about God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You're not fooling the church. You're fooling God. You think you're fooling God. You're really fooling yourself. So he says, put on the armor of light. So when you cast, you can't put on the armor of light unless you cast off darkness. You understand? That's why he said cast out off darkness first. You have to repent and believe the gospel. You put on the armor of light. And what does that mean? The armor of light refers to the fact that once a person receives and believes the gospel, you have to continually rehearse and hear the truth of the gospel. And that operates as a shield and armor that protects your mind from the deception of the enemy. It becomes an armor. Light. 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 The day is dawn. Salvation. The light that dawns inside of you. The light of God now is not just a mechanism for initial salvation. It is now a mechanism to protect your mind and heart from falling into the works of darkness. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Do you have a stronghold in your life? The stronghold in your life is defined by Paul by wrong thinking. He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so what does the armor of light do? The armor of light protects us from false thinking, deception. And through the light, we can take down wrong thinking and imaginations and bring it into the obedience of Christ. And then he says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And so he describes what he means by uh, walking in darkness here, orgies, drunkenness, sexual morality, sensuality. Notice that of everything he mentions to describe walking in darkness, out of the five things, three of the five had to do with sexual immorality. Yeah. Sexual immorality is any sexual act outside of one man, one woman in holy matrimony. That's the Bible. Anything else is sexual immorality. And so... It seems like in those days, it's similar to today, the greatest temptation was sexual sin and immorality. But he says the answer for that is not behavior modification. It's not, well, i got to make sure I don't look at this woman. I, I don't want her to, I can't sleep with her, I can't be with her. Well, obviously you want to use your will, but what he says the answer is, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ooh, yeah. You can't do it yourself. He has to be your life, your power, your identity. John the Baptist said in John 3, 31, he says, he must increase. Then he said, I will decrease. The way you overcome these works of darkness, obviously, if you're living in sin, you repent of you turn away. But then you go to God and meditate and spend time with God. And that is how you have the power. Being in fellowship, hearing the word, meditating in the word. This is how. You put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is the head 
We are the neck down. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is not just spending time alone with God. It's being in church. You're putting on. You're with. You're identifying with. You are putting on means an act of your will where you are now putting yourself under the covering of Jesus. What is the covering? What's the church? The visible representation of the invisible Jesus is the church. So there's no way you're going to live for God without God's body. We are the body of Christ. Then he says, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't give the flesh a loophole. Don't allow the flesh an open door. In other words, you let the flesh in a little bit, it's going to come right, it's going to run right in your life. And so, how do we make provision for the flesh? Either by being passive and not resisting the temptations and the works of darkness, or by allowing ourselves to be tempted or a participant in situations that propagate the flesh. Don't make provision for the flesh. Don't entertain it. Don't walk towards it. And so, what is the application of all this to us today? We have to ask ourselves these three questions. Are you willing to submit to Christ and intentionally live a life of love? If you're not married and you're sleeping with your girlfriend, you do not love her because you're hurting her walk with God. You do not love your man if you are causing him to fall into sin because you're pulling him away from God. I can't. I, I don't think I could be any more direct than that. So, are you willing to live a life of love? Don't say I love you, and then you would be flirting with somebody. Why? You, your very actions contradict your words when you're hurting somebody, going after a married man, married woman or trying to sleep with somebody you're not married to them, or you have no intention of marrying them, you're just using them because you have, uh, you know, a feeling. Here's another application. Are you still holding on to your old identity with the works of the flesh, or have you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't mean you just sing to nice hill song, worship songs in your room, and feel so good and wear a cross and then you go out and you live in the works of darkness. Sorry. Doesn't cut it. What is your identity? Are you willing to surrender your whole life to Jesus today? That's the question Paul is asking. Let's pray.